Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization with the mission and vision of furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I'm a dental surgeon and also the CEO of this organization. So today we have a case presentation about retrieval of a broken screw from a screw retained crown. Now, screw retained crowns, uh, one of the issues, or actually with any sort of like implant, uh, screws can become loose. Uh, many times this is due to the, what they refer to as the settling effect, and one not being, uh, t not, one not taking the steps of retorquing a screw uh, shortly after initially torquing it. Uh, however, even with this step, sometimes screws can come loose, especially in patients who are bruxers who aren't necessarily wearing uh, their bruxism appliances. So the problem with these loose screws is if patients don't come in, these screws can continually get more and more loose until eventually they break. The key thing with these sorts of cases is to ensure that the patient comes in early for two reasons. Number one, you want to ensure that the soft tissue doesn't uh, heal over these things. And number two, you want to ensure that plaque and calculus don't build up inside the screw channel, uh, limiting your ability to remove this screw uh, from this implant and uh, replacing this restoration with a new screw. So let's take a look at our case here. So in our case, we have patient X who is a 42-year-old healthy female who had a screw-retained crown placed on the upper left maxillary central incisor around five years ago. She had noted that it had become loose and one day just sort of fell off when she was biting into a sandwich. And so she presents to the clinic with the crown in hand and she noted that the crown had fallen off about a week earlier. So when we take a look at this photograph here, one can see the actual crown. Uh, this is a screw-retained crown, not a cemented crown. One of the challenges of cemented crowns is that it becomes a little bit more difficult to basically remove the screw without actually damaging uh, the cemented crown. If it's in a screw-retained position, one can easily repair this uh, using, uh, sorry, when I say screw-retained position, I mean on the lingual aspect, one can easily repair this using some sort of a porcelain uh, composite repair kit. However, if it's going to be going through the buckle aspect, it's kind of difficult to do this while maintaining reasonable aesthetics for the patient. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I sort of prefer uh, screw retained lingual axes over cemented crowns. Nonetheless, many times we are limited by the, the foundation or the bone when replacing the implant. So many times, uh, even in my own uh, professional career, I've had to be, uh, place cemented crowns in patients. So as you can see here, you can see that the screw has basically broken off at the juncture of this internal uh, internal hex uh, with the implant uh, facing. So one of the nice things about internal hex implants is that they're a lot easier to remove screws as compared to trying to remove a broken screw from an external hex implant. So moving to the next uh, picture, uh, clinically you can see that this patient had come in about a week after this tooth had fallen off and one can see that the gingiva has basically grown over uh, this, this the uh, implant screw access site. Upon taking a radiograph, uh, or sorry, looking at this picture here, we, you can see that we actually drilled into the lingual aspect of the of the crown, and we removed the broken segment of the screw. So you can see that this is the broken screw. And in uh, the radiograph, we basically want to take a radiograph to confirm that there is a broken segment of screw. So you can see the broken segment of screw inside the actual implant. And one can also sort of assess the bone levels and ensure that uh, the bone is healthy and that everything else is going well. So from a treatment plan perspective, more or less what we want to do for this patient is we want to get consent from the patient and talk to the patient about the, the, uh, the options that are going to be available here. So you have to be able to tell the patient that, yes, you have to remove the uh, broken part of the screw from the tooth. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if it's the case that the uh, the crown is cemented versus uh, versus uh, uh, screw retained, uh, having a lingual screw retained channel, you have to tell the patient they may require a new crown at the end of the procedure. Uh, you also have to tell the patient that there's a possibility that you might not be able to remove the broken segment out, uh, limiting uh, the uh, things that you may be able to do for this patient. Uh, once you get the consent from the patient, the, in this pa particular case, since the gingiva had grown over, uh, you want to anesthetize the patient and remove the soft tissue that has sort of grown over and gain access to that implant surface and be able to visualize or adequately visualize uh, that broken screw segment. Then you want to do, you do one of the techniques to try to retrieve the broken screw. We're going to talk about three techniques uh, in this case presentation. Uh, we're going to use uh, one of those techniques. And then finally you want to reinsert the crown with a new screw 
and uh, make sure that this new screw is you know, placed uh, placed uh, with adequate torque and in order to address what they refer to as a settling effect usually we like to wait 10 minutes and then basically go back and retorque the screw to 30 newton centimeters or whatever the prescribed uh, torque setting is for your particular implant system and then finally you want to ensure that there's adequate follow-up and also you address the cause of the problem and in this particular case the patient had a bruxism habit had a bite plate but she wasn't wearing the bite plate so it's a matter of uh, just communicating with the patient that requires requirements or the need to ensure that they wear the bite plate. In this particular case, we were able to successfully retrieve the screw and reinsert the crown for the patient. However, you need to tell the patient that if they do this again, there may be a chance that you know the screw is not going to be able to be retrieved or in through the retrieval process, you end up damaging the internal aspect of the implant, hence uh, basically making the whole thing uh, unusable. unusable, unusable. So uh, it's always ensured, important to make sure that you uh, communicate these points and document these points uh, for your patient. So in terms of retrieval, there's three techniques. So method one is basically inserting a very fine-tipped hand instrument into the implant and gently wedging it between the male and female threads. And with careful counterclockwise rotation, as you're going to see in our video, the fractured male thread can often be unscrewed and removed. A variation of this method is to use an ultrasonic scaling tip on top of the screw head with a counterclockwise rotation. Just a word of warning, you're going to think maybe I can take a high-speed or a low-speed handpiece and try to basically create a little bit of a, a notch in the tooth. If you do do this, you have to make sure that you wedge something against the actual broken segment because remember that most of the time our high speeds and slow speeds spin clockwise and when you sort of hit the facing of this broken screw you'll actually thread this thing further down making your job very difficult. Uh, method two as I basically we talked about here is using a small round bird with a high speed handpiece and cutting a shallow 0.5 millimeter dimple into the top of the broken screw uh, using copious amounts of irrigation to keep it from overheating uh, the implant during this portion of the process. And then taking a diamond or fluted end cutting burr and wedging it into the dimple and slowly uh, at 30 to 5 to 50 RPM rotating in reverse using moderate occlusal pressure. As I would mentioned, when you do use that small round burr with the high speed, make sure that you wedge something between the male and female threads in order to ensure that this thing doesn't spin down further into the implant. And finally, method number three is using a small diameter burr to cut a 0.5 to 1 millimeter deep slot in the top of the remaining male thread and then using a small straight bladed screwdriver or dental instrument to use uh, to uh, engage the slot to remove the screw. As I'm saying here anecdotally in my own experience, if method one or two does not work, method two or three are really hard. And the key thing, as I'd mentioned previously, is to get the patient in early. So let's take a look at our video now. So you can see in this video what I've basically done here is I'm using an endodontic explorer and the endodontic explorer I actually have, I'm rotating it uh, between the male and female threads there in a counterclockwise direction. And this particular endodontic explorer has a bit of a bend on the tip of it. Uh, this wasn't done uh, purposefully, this was actually just done uh, accidentally. One of my assistants, when they were sterilizing the instrument, ended up putting a little bit of a bend in it. But the advantage of this bend is that it really sort of helps give you a little bit more bite towards grabbing that uh, that uh, uh, screw head thread. So it's, it's just a matter of patience. It takes time to sort of get this thing to move. Sometimes it's only going to move like maybe you know a fraction of a turn uh, each time but just it's it's just about being persistent and continually using the same same method over and over again and I can assure you then that in using around five to ten minutes you should be able to get the screw out so we'll just continually observe this video So just continuing to use that 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 counterclockwise motion. The camera's jiggling here a bit, but you can sort of see here. You'll see in a few seconds. You'll actually start seeing that that screw is going to start moving right here. There you go. And with a bit of patience, you can see I've sort of switched over to an Explorer, which once again has a little bit of a bend uh, at that um, at the tip. And this is to sort of help facilitate. Uh, getting a little bit more bite on that broken screw segment and getting that counterclockwise uh, motion to remove that broken segment. Back 
closer shelf. Just asking my assistant just to ensure that there's adequate suction here. In this particular case, we had anesthetized the patient to remove that excess soft tissue that had grown over. When removing the soft tissue, one of the other things that you should also note is make sure that you aren't going to limit the amount of keratinized tissue that's going to be around this at the end. So you can see we got uh, through a bit of patience, we're able to get that broken segment out. We'll have a few photographs at the end. So we removed that broken segment. Now we're just irrigating that implant uh, just with a bit of chlorhexidine. You can also use the 0.25% sodium hypochlorite rinse just to ensure that things are detoxified. And now we're putting the crown back in for the patient using a brand new screw and remembering that we're going to have to torque the screw in and also retorque the screw after about 10 minutes to address that settling effect so that this issue doesn't happen again. And also uh, reinforcing with the patient that it's important that the patient wear their bite plate uh, or whatever the factor it was that you've determined uh, caused the loosening of the screw. And so the crown is in and my assistant will show you here. You can see that looks really nice. And we'll go grab my torque wrench now. Okay, take and we're just going to demonstrate here torquing of the actual implant. And once that's been done, and everything's been torqued in nice and appropriately, we'll move on to our photographs here. So in this photograph here, you can actually see a picture of the actual broken segment once the soft tissue cuff was removed. And in this picture here, you can see the broken segment of screw that was uh, sitting uh, outside of the implant. And this is the tooth back in place with the screw retained crown. You can see a bit of the white and the tissue as the implant crown is pushing up against that soft tissue that's sort of grown over. This white uh, color will go away after a few minutes. So we retorqued the implant crown in. And in this panoral radiograph, you can see that the implant is back in, it's seated nicely, and there's no evidence of any uh, bone loss around this tooth. And in this periapical radiograph, well, we're just confirming the same things. So post-operative checklist is ensuring for this patient that the Teflon plug or cotton pellet or whatever you're using, some people use wax, some people use gutta perca, is in and that the composite resin cover is on and the occlusion has been checked. All the other things, other steps that you take, so normally you check your contacts, you check to ensure that the crown is seated, and then you want to check, ensure, check to ensure that the occlusion is good for the, for the patient. Number two, you want to provide post-operative instructions in, in the form of care of the surgical site, uh, oral hygiene and rinses. In this particular case, we had anesthetized the patient and uh, cut the soft tissue in order to facilitate retrieval of the screw. Number three, you want to ensure that any sort of post-operative medications that are required for the patient have been provided in the form of analgesics. And uh, number four, you want to ensure that a post-operative follow-up appointment is scheduled to ensure that, once again, the patient's wearing their bite plate and there's no other, uh, other issues that have arisen out of this procedure. Number five, you want to ensure that the patient is fit for discharge with the responsible adult escort, especially if sedation was used uh, along with the procedure. In this case, we didn't use any form of sedation other than local anesthetic. However, uh, many times we have patients who you can't really work on without any uh, adjuvant uh, sedation. So I've included a number of references here that we use in the production of this uh, of this case presentation. And on behalf of the entire treatment team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for listening to our case presentation.